be seated. Amen. Thank you, John. Welcome to all today. Thank you for coming on Jet Lag Sunday. Delighted that you are here as we uh, lost an hour last night, but uh, glad you showed up today. So welcome. If you're a guest with us, please find the guest registration card. They're right there in front of you in the pew rack. Just pull one out, fill it out on both sides, drop it in the offering plate. For all of you, there is at the end of the pews or somewhere on there a little brochure that looks like this. Hope every family will get one. It, it is our uh, week of prayer for North American missions for Annie Armstrong and what Southern Baptists do in our five regions of North America. And so it's a great prayer too. Take that Sunday through Sunday and pray, pray, pray. One of the places uh, in here is in, the, uh, in Canada and we've got a mission team headed there. And in a moment when we all stand to greet one another, I'm going to ask our mission team can it, uh, folks to come, our team, and just line all across. And I'm going to ask them to kneel in a moment. They're 25 of those young people and their leaders are going to make their way right here and we're going to pray over them before they get ready to go off to the most lost city in North America. There is a smaller percentage of believers in Montreal, Canada than any city in North America. We're planning a church there. Our church planner's first name is Francois, and he's been here. You know him a little bit. He'll be back. And know that when you give today in your offering time, we're helping him along with some other churches that we're the lead, and they come alongside of us, and we go and help, and we, we also help fund Francois and uh, him being there, and so thank God for all that you do. I'm going to ask our uh, teenagers to come while we all stand to greet one another. When our mission team come line across here, and we're going to pray over them and greet them in just a moment. So turn and greet one another. Amen. If you would, just find a seat. Would you sit down? Boy, all this baptizing and fellowshipping. It's fun come church, isn't it? Amen. If it quits being fun, I ain't coming. All right? Hey, we're delighted that this crew, I had my phone here. I was checking the weather in Montreal. It's better here than it is there. But it's not bad, okay? It's uh, spring is starting to come. So we've got this crew here, and high schoolers are going to be headed to Montreal. And John, when is it we're going? This Friday, 6 a.m. flight out of Pensacola Friday morning, okay? Go to Atlanta on a regional jet, get on another regional jet, and go all the way to Montreal, amen. So we'll be praying for them as they get ready to take off. What I'm going to ask you to do, all of you that are here, I'm just going to ask you to turn your back on those folks and look at me and just kneel right here if you would. So if you would, just uh, come right here and kneel. And I want us to pray and ask God's mercy, blessing, favor, as we dedicate these young people to the Lord as they take off on Friday and for the good work they'll be doing and helping, uh, reaching out. There'll be a lot of fun things to do, uh, but there'll also be some very serious things to do as they interact with a lost, educated culture. Uh, study a little bit about Montreal. It's a hard place, but God is doing something there. We've got a couple of church plants really taking off and doing phenomenal. And we are looking for the same out of what we're doing. Would you young people just join hands there with each other right across here and let's make a team out of you and you pray for them right now as I lead us. Father, thank you for opportunity to give, for opportunity to pray, and then, Lord, the opportunity to go. Thank you for these that are taking their time and going to Montreal I pray, Lord, that they'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. I pray, Father, they'll be able to speak a good word for you to someone lost. I pray, Lord, that they would do good hands with their, uh, good work with their hands uh, and show the mercy and love of Christ. Lord, we do pray for their safety. And we ask you, Lord, that you'd keep everyone kneeling across here physically fit and well, not only this week, but next. And I pray, Lord, that we'll hear great reports as they did in Jerusalem in Acts 15 of what the mighty Spirit of God has done. We dedicate these young people and these leaders unto you and we pray your favor and your blessing on this mission trip. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless every one of you and I'll be praying every day. 
that God use you mightily. Give them a good hand. They go back to their seat and you be praying, praying, praying for them. Amen. Thank you, John. John, you come. Let's stand together. We're going to worship the King and give praise unto the Father. 1 Timothy 1, 15 said, It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world. This is His mission to save sinners. How many of you were sinners saved by Jesus Christ in His mercy today? Amen. He showed us compassion. Let's sing of His compassion and His salvation together. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of the Savior. The hope of nations. He's our only hope. Sing it, Savior, He can move the mountains. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God. victorious conqueror and he's conquered sin and death and hell and the grave. Let's sing his next great verse. Lord, take me as you find me. Surrender your heart to him as you sing it. So take me as you find me. All my fears and failures. Fill my life again. Give my life to follow. Everything I believe in, now I Yeah. 
Well, we're going to give our offering unto the Lord, so you're ready to do that. Brother Ken Lobby, would you come and pray over us? And as Brother Ken makes his way right here, he'll pray and we'll give unto the Lord. You pray for Francois this morning and all of our missionaries across North America. A lot of work need to be done. Kevin Ezel, President of North American Mission Board. He was in town this week, had lunch with him on Tuesday. and uh, They're doing a great work. It's tough work, but uh, you pray for them. That, uh, God use them in a mighty way. Way. Brother Ken's going to uh, leave. Some of you may not know, this is John Tyner's father in law. All right? And is Angie in the choir? Yeah, she is right up there. And that's, that's his little girl right up there. And uh, Ken Lobby will tell you the greatest day's work John Tyner ever did was the day he married that woman he's married to. Uh, so, uh, guarantee. Amen, Brother Ken? Amen. Yeah, that's right. You pray for us, and we'll give unto the Lord. Amen. Thank you. Pray with me if you would. Father, we come to you this morning. Lord, we lift your name up and we praise you, first of all. We thank you. Father, we come to you with grateful hearts. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for using us. And we surrender ourselves for your use today. Father, I ask your blessing on this group going to Canada. Father, that they wouldn't be going for themselves, but going to be used totally by you. I pray that they would just completely surrender themselves to your spirit's leading. Father, would you bless Francois, anoint his lips as he speaks, anoint his heart. Father, we thank you for him. We ask your blessing on his work. Lord, would you bless this morning's offering? Father, we just give you thanks for all things, for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Well, today is a bittersweet day for myself as well as the Olive family as a whole when we say goodbye to the Gilliland family. Robert, Faith, and the kids have been dear friends, and not only to myself, but to all of our staff, church family. Uh, we ordained Robert as a deacon years ago, then watched him come down the aisle and give his life to, to ministry and leave us and go off to seminary, then come back and work with us in our children's area and doing a great job there. And then, of course, is our minister of uh, education and helping us uh, as we share uh, the Word of God with, with our people. Uh, I just cannot say enough how much I love this man, his wife, his kids, and we will bitterly miss them as they make their way south to go and win the magic kingdom to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Seriously, Robert is going uh, down to Central Florida and will be doing a marvelous job working with hurting people, families that with children need housing and planting churches, and will do a great job. We're going to pray for them, encourage them, support them, and uh, we'll remember fondly all of the things we did here, planting churches uh, in New York City that he was so uh, involved in helping us do that, as well as I've traveled the world with uh, Robert and uh, been to Romania and uh, the time we've traveled there. He, he's just been a great friend. Robert, we will miss you, and we thank God for you, Faith, for your children. Uh, thank God uh, for them, for Zach and Katie, and we pray God's favor and blessing on you this very night. Take your Bible, go to 2 Corinthians today in uh, chapter 2 and verse 14 through 17 as we make our way through uh, 2 Corinthians, the first seven chapters. This morning we are looking at victory in the battle of the soul. Now, now get these verses, these four verses, don't, don't miss this. 2 Corinthians uh, 2, beginning in verse 14, 14, 15, 16, 17, Paul Christianizes one of the great events in the Roman Empire. It would be likened to us, though, but beyond it, uh, the inauguration of the President of the United States or Super Bowl Sunday across the world. Uh, it, it's something that just gathered up Rome and all of the empire of Rome. And Paul looks at that and he makes a parable. He uses a story. He Christianizes this event that I want to introduce you to this day. Here's what he said about it. 2 Corinthians 2, 14. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph. Always leads us in triumph. The one word there, that's the operative phrase today. Leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, an aroma from death to death. To the other, an aroma from life to life. Don't miss this question. And who is adequate for these things? For we are not like many, peddling the word of God, but as from sincerity, but as from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. Look at verse 14. But thanks be to God. It's a great thanksgiving text. Thanks be to God who always, and as he says at the end of the verse, in every place, always and in every place, leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests this aroma through us. Paul had seen it as a lost man and maybe as a saved man, but he had seen it. He had known when the Roman Senate voted and conferred on a conquering general the honor of having a Roman triumphant procession. When a Roman general would go into the world and he would conquer a portion of that world, when he returned to Rome and if the Senate so conveyed, they would say we are having for this general the last one to have this was Diocletian. It was the year 302 A.D. We know that Caesar Augustus had a triumphant procession. Pompey had a triumphant procession. Augustus Caesar, also the Senate conferred 
on him. Sometimes this would last two, maybe three days. They would gather outside the walls of Rome and get everything ready, and they would come marching through the city, down the Apian Way, down, down the main thoroughfare, leading all the way up to the temple of Jupiter. Trumpeters, playing drums, of course, armies in procession, banners unfurled in the wind. It's a magnificent occasion that grips the whole Roman Empire because the conquering hero has come home. Every politician that was anybody or wanted to be a politician walked in this procession. Hmm. And then finally, of course, came the general. You know, the Thanksgiving parade's not over till Santa Claus arrives. Well, the triumphant procession's not over until the general arrives. He's in a chariot, flags flapping, and chained to his chariot are the conquered ones, generals from another place, another region, another nation that he has conquered. It is said when Titus came after uh, his Senate confirmation of the Roman procession that there were barrels of gold. They brought great wealth, livestock from other places. Today in Rome, you find the Arch of Titus. It is still there. They would build this archway, and through that archway would come all of this procession leading up to the temple. And as they went down the main thoroughfare, there were huge vats of incense being burned and they would dump fragrant perfume in there and all through the city you would smell the incense as, as the procession came. I have started thinking on this, America doesn't have anything like this. Maybe back for some of you old enough to remember ticker tape parades when somebody would come home. We only do that now when the Yankees win, okay, uh, or some other team. Uh, now you get three minutes with the president if you win a national champion. But that's, that's nothing. This is a national holiday. This is three days set aside. It's like the inauguration of a president, but the smell. You, you have to get the smell. Have you been to the county fair? Now, I don't mean where the livestock are. That's a one aroma. But as you walk down the midway, it's corn dogs popcorn, fried Twinkies. <laughs> Can you smell it? <laughs> There's this uh, aroma that goes with the county fair when you walk down the midway. And they're, they're hawking things at you and selling, and, and you can smell all of the fried stuff and uh, all that, that's there. There was the incense. Down that Appian Way, it was, you could smell it everywhere. And Paul, Paul steps back and, and he watches this. And he Christianizes the triumphant entry. And he said, that's us. You know, we do it all the time. We talk about the Super Bowl and it's a big game and there's warfare and there's the good guys in the back. You know, we do those things a lot. Paul here in this text is talking about being led in triumph in Christ. Jesus is now the conquering general. He's been to the grave. He's overcome death, hell, and the grave. He's leading us up, not to the temple of Jupiter. He's, he's leading us to the very throne of God. And we are chained to his chair. Now, now here is where people have a different interpretation because Paul does not give us everything he's thinking here. He just simply uses that triumph and says it's there. And then, of course, with the incense and, and all that's coming, it's the picture of this Roman processional. Some people say, no, the Christians are not the ones chained to the chariot. No, we're the victors. I beg to differ. I believe we are chained to the chariot. We are not the victors. He is the victor. 
It is because of his authority that we have victory. We do not have victory in ourselves. We are chained to the chariot, and we are coming with the Lord. As, as, as Paul Christianizes or parabolizes this Roman triumphal entry, I want you to think with me about three simple thoughts that, that I mine out of this today. Number one, conflict before salvation. You, you must be in a conflict. You must be lost before you are saved. Jesus has fought a war. He fought the war for your soul. He fought the battle. When he went to the cross, your sin was laid on him. He died for you. It was the battle. You must be in conflict. Before you can ever get saved, you must see yourself as God's opponent, as being on the other side. You see, the lost are the opponents of God. The lost resist Christ. And the Holy Spirit confronts our sin and confronts our lostness and demands one thing. We must surrender. It's what Paul saw in his own life. I think this is the reason Paul saw this. When he gave his testimony the first time in Acts chapter 9 in verse number 4, and the Spirit of God was speaking to him, and he heard Jesus say these words, and he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You see, Saul was an opponent of Jesus. He was trying to kill the church. He was the opponent. He was in direct conflict to Christ. There must be conflict before there can be salvation. And Paul, who was the enemy of Christ, became a soldier of the cross. Now, I don't know who you are in this room today. But hear me, dear friend, if you are outside of Christ, you are God's enemy. You are God's opponent. I do not mean that you are the enemy where God is fighting against you. I'm telling you, you are opposed to the things of God. But this captain is not trying to kill you. He's trying to save you. And he's wooing you to come off of the broad road that leads to destruction and join the narrow highway group that leads to everlasting life. This triumph spoke of a conflict whether it was Augustus Caesar in Egypt or whether it was Titus going to Judea or anywhere else that these men went around the world. But you see, with us, when we are lost, we are in conflict. And the only way, the only way to get right with God is full surrender. In, in Crimea today, we've all heard about Crimea. Nobody in here hardly knew where Crimea was. <laughs> but boy, we know this part of that country that is being ripped and ruined, torn. Out. What's going to happen in the Crimea? I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. On the 14th of this month, they're going to vote to become Russians. That's what's going to happen. I'm, that's, I'm a prophet today. And they will say, we resign from this country and we join this country. You agree, disagree, don't like it, whatever. You, but let me tell you, when you come to be saved, here's what you've got to do. You've got to say, I used to be with this crowd, and now I'm going with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It's called repentance. You have turned from the way you were in your lostness, and you have turned unto Christ who has wooed you to save you. There's a conflict there, but you see, conflict always comes before salvation but you can step out of the conflict and come to be at peace with holy God today if you will surrender unto him. Secondly, in this story, in this parable, in this Christianization of the triumph, uh, not only uh, do we see in it that conflict comes before the salvation comes, but then capture requires submission. Now watch this, watch this. I believe that Paul saw himself not only as saved, but I, I think he saw himself in submission, chained to the chariot. That's where we've got to be. And the key word here is not surrender, but submission. You must be in submission unto the Lord. Don't worry, somebody just hit the wrong button. They'll get it fixed. <laughs> you, you, you must get in submission unto the Lord. And, and when you get in submission, things will be well. It's coming. Just trust me. I'm just telling you it's coming. All right, here we go. Amen. Got it back in preacher mode? <laughs> Amen. Here we go. The capture. You must be captured by Christ. The victory is the Lord's, not yours. Amen. 
Understand this. You do not have authority save what God gives you. It is not in you. We've got too many Houdini Christians in the church today. They once were chained to the chariot, but somehow they get out of the chains. And they go their own way with no submission in their life. Uh, I'm old enough now that young preachers come see me. Matter of fact, some of them offer to pay. They say, I'll come, I give $100 for an hour. I used to do that. I offered money to Adrian Rogers. We wouldn't take the money, but he let me come for a weekend. I said, well, I want to pay you for your time. No, no, you can't do that. I would never let a young preacher do that. They want to come sit and talk. And so they ask questions and this, and they always get around to this question. They say, Pastor, what are you responsible for at Olive? What, what is your responsibility? And just in the last couple of years, I answer that differently because I've come to a new understanding. I said, write this down. I am responsible for me. Write that down. M-E. It is a great day for a pastor when he understands he's not responsible for building the church. Jesus said, I'll build my church. Amen. Hey, it was a great day for me when I, was, when I came to understand that I was not ultimately responsible for my own family. That's God's family. I'm responsible for me. If, if I will keep me chained to the chariot, walking in the fullness of the Holy Ghost, I'm telling you this church will really do well. My family will flourish if I keep myself chained to the chariot. But what most of you men want to do is you want to so be the authority and the boss that your family, you won't even listen to Jesus. You just want to run things with an iron fist and you're killing your family because you've missed submission. Can I get a witness? I'm telling you it's the truth. You don't have authority unless given to God. The greatest illustration of this is in Matthew 8 with the centurion. Remember the centurion came to Jesus? And the centurion said, I've got a child that's sick. And Lord, you don't even have to go there. Just, just speak the word and he'll be well. And, and notice what he said, for I too, I also. There's what the, that's the key word, I also. For I also and a man under authority with soldiers under me. I say to this one, go, and he goes. Another one, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. You see, the I also is so important because the centurion understood he didn't have authority in himself. He only had authority because he was under the Caesar at Rome and because the Caesar was the ultimate authority and he, the centurion, was under him. Therefore, those under him, he said, I also am a man. I'm under authority. Let me tell you, friend, when you get under the authority of Jesus and submission to your life, those that are with you in your church, if you're a pastor, in your class, if you're a teacher, in your family, if you're a man or a woman, when you learn submission to the king of kings, you'll find that authority then begins to cascade down through you. You have no authority on your own. None. It is all God given. Every good and perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights. That's given to us. This last Thursday, I took my uh, son and daughter to lunch and my little granddaughter, and uh, we were out to eat. And just before we left, I sent an email to all the staff so I'd noticed Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday in the office, and I'd been in there, that no one was picking up their large mail, uh, mailbox packages. We had huge things in there. And, and I mean, it was just junked up everywhere. It looked awful. It just boxes. They were around everywhere. And so I sent out an all-staff email when I left for lunch at 11 o'clock. I said, the workroom at Olive is not a warehouse. Come get your things. Signed affectionately, your pastor. That was 11 o'clock. I got back at 1.15 after lunch and another quick stop, and I came in, and there was not one box in the workroom. Somebody had delivered all of them. They were all gone. It, it was clean and looked great. And one of the secretaries, matter of fact, it was Robert's secretary, came up to me, and she looked up at me, and she said, Pastor, you are all powerful. I said, what are you talking about? She said, you've been in the workroom? I stuck my head in there and I said, wow. Now listen to me. Why'd they clean that out? I said, well, because you're the boss. Yes, well, where's authority come from? Let me tell you, friend, I don't have authority. 
I only have authority here because I bring my life under the authoritarian one who is the captain of our salvation, who has appointed me to be the under-shepherd of the church, and therefore there is some authority that comes. But it's not in me. It's not mine. It's his, and he cascades down to us, and you only have authority as you bring yourself under the one who has authority over you. See, if you ever get to the place that you understand you'll never have authority over those that are under you until you are under the one who is over you. Now, I know some of you missed that, so I'll give it to you again. You will never have authority over those that are under you until you are under the one who is over you. And the authority comes up. As the centurion said, I also am a man under authority. That's why I can say to one go, another one come, this one do that. He said, because the authority comes from Rome. We must die unto ourselves. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, verses 10, 11, and 12 very quickly. Look at this. Always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our mortal flesh. So death works in us but life in you. Do you understand it? Death is where I'm dying to me so the life of Jesus can work in you. Friend, there ain't nothing good in you but Jesus. I'm just telling you, when, when some of you teenagers get over yourself, God's going to use you. When you come to understand you're not hot as you thought you were, God's going to use you. But when you think you're somebody, when you're really nobody, You've, you've misplaced authority. You've got to get chained <laughs> to the chariot. Everybody take your Bible. I, I, want you, I just found this. It's amazing what you'll find in this book. I just in my quiet time this week, I said, that, that's my sermon. Go to Numbers. Numbers, this probably won't come up on the screen. N Numbers 9, I just kind of threw this in this morning. Numbers 9, I found this three days ago. Look, look at this, Numbers 9. You, you know the story. Israel's wandering in the wilderness and, and they're led by fire by night, but in the daytime there's a cloud and, and look what happens with, with the cloud. The Bible says in Numbers 9, 22, whether it was two days or a month or a year that the cloud lingered over the tabernacle, staying above it, the sons of Israel remained camped and they did not set out. Whether it was two days, whether it was a month, or whether it was a year, if the cloud stayed, they stayed. But when it was lifted, they did set out. Verse 23, at the command of the Lord they camped, and at the command of the Lord they set out. Bless God if we'll ever learn that. When God says get still, get still, and God says go, go. Amen, Robert. When God says stay, stay. When God says go, go. They kept the Lord's charge according to the command of the Lord through Moses. What you got to do, friends, is get chained to the chariot, and wherever the chariot goes, you go. And as long as Jesus is riding in the chariot, all is well. Because he said right here in this text, thanks be to God who leads us always, that's time, at the end of it, in every place, that's space, time and space, that's where we live. We live in time and space. And I'm telling you, Jesus is Lord in every time and every space. He gives victory. You don't have victory. Jesus gives it. When you get dead to yourself and Christ is through you, and some of you don't understand this, you're looking at me like the proverbial calf at the gate, and you, you, you just, see, you've been taught so long, just, you know, you, you got to rise up and be who you are. Let me tell you, we've had all of you we need. <laughs> it's about time we had some Jesus come through you. I've preached to people, I've had people who say to me, I don't like that. Well, I, I understand, I don't like it either. But I'm telling you, when the glory of God begins to come and you understand, I mean, you don't have to worry about it. It's his church, it's his family. You, you just stay ch chained to the chariot. What's my response? My responsibility is me. And if I'll stay humble before God, filled with the Spirit of God, filled with the Word of God, doing what God's called me to do, I'm just telling you things will go well. You must come to submission. But now thirdly, real quick, 
There, there's a last thing. He, he begins to talk about this fragrance. There is conduct. In this, conduct reveals character is what I learned out of this. Th that we see our conduct in the world because of the character that is within us. He, he says that there is this aroma, this sweet aroma of the knowledge of him, and it's in every place. He says, for we're a fragrance, verse 15, of Christ to God among those who are being saved. That's what we're singing about this morning. All those that are being saved, we're, we're the fragrance. And to those that are perishing. You see, you're the fragrance to those that are saved. That's fellowship, and you love one another. Yeah, aren't you? I'm just so tired of arrogant church members, mad church members, mean church members. Bless God. I'm in charge. You ain't charging nothing. God may kill you. He can, you know. Or he may make the rest of us suffer through your carnality. Because you are not a sweet-smelling aroma. You stink. And it's time you change. That's called repentance. See, friend, just because you're 75 does not give you license to be mean as the devil. Y'all didn't hear that, evidently. I, I see people, the older they get, the meaner they get. You want to know what's happened there? I'm telling you what's happened. Those people that get meaner when they're older, they have just been physically and mentally and psychologically capable of masking the meanness in their character when they're younger. And when they get older, they just open all the doors. <laughs> then they mean as hell. And I have my grave doubts whether they're even saved or not. I really do. They've just played religion, and all of a sudden, they're just mean. Now, I watch my daddy. He's 88 years old. The older he gets, the sweeter he becomes. I, I love Delton Trailer. I, I'm telling you right now, he prays more. He shares the gospel more. He reads the word of God more. He's, he's got one foot in heaven. Every time I see him, well, you know, I probably won't be here next time you come. For 15 years he's been saying it. <laughs> I call, how you doing? Huh? Right. I said, how you doing? Oh. What? <laughs> I said, give the phone to mama. <laughs> Tell him put his hearing aid in before I call next time. Said, he's not going to do that. He don't care. And he said, oh, you know, I just can't hear and he'll hug me and cry. I sure love you. How's little Kathy? Oh, leave me alone. I'm trying to suck up through your great granddaughter. I'm, I'm. But just to get so sweet. You know these people, they're just sweet. And then you know that other crowd. They don't have a sweet aroma. See, to, to the fellowship, that, that's to the but then to those that are perishing, let me tell you, friend, if you'll quit being mean to lost people, you may win some. If you, you, if, if you quit drawing hard lines to people, you may win somebody. You, you catch more flies with sugar than you will with vinegar. Amen. Well, you got a lost neighbor, love on them a little bit. Take them a cake. Go over and cut their grass. Reach out. If you want to love them, be a sweet smelling. Say, I'm telling you, for that to come, there must be ultimate submission. All right, this morning I gave you three words, and then we're going to have an invitation. Let's go back and look at those three words. Number one is the word surrender, surrender. If you're lost, you, you, you got to come to Christ and surrender. Full surrender. I give up. Lord, Lord I surrender all, all to the I, oh, Lord, I surrender. That's, some of you all got to get up out of your seat here this morning. Get up. Come right down here and take me by the hand and say, Pastor, I surrender. I surrender. Second word, submission, submission. Chained to the chariot. Jesus is the conquering captain of our salvation. And wherever he goes, we go. We're just following him all the way to the throne of grace. We must be in submission unto him. Some of you have never joined Olive Baptist Church because you're not in submission to the leadership of God, but you know now today it ought to be time. And you're coming. Some of you have heard for the first time you ought to do that, and you're coming in submission. Some of you have never been baptized like these. I don't know. We baptized 14, 15 people this morning already in this service in the first. And uh, you, you've never been baptized. You ought to come in submission. See, if we're, if we're not careful, we'll, we'll get stiff-necked. I told you on Thursday, I took my kids out to eat, and we took little Catherine with us. She's 13 months. 
she's fiddling around there, and Rachel looked at her and said, Catherine, no. And when she said no, my granddaughter looked at her mama and went. <laughs> she didn't smile. She didn't say a word. She just looked at her mama. Because that's what Rachel does to her. And she said, Catherine, no. And she looked right back. At and I looked at my daughter and I said, two things I want to tell you. Number one, total depravity. She has a great case of total depravity. Number two, she caught it from you. <laughs> and that's true. When Adam died, we all died. And that's when Jesus changes us and we quit doing this and we start doing this. That's when submission comes and you've got a sweet, sweet aroma. That's the third thing I want you to see this morning. After surrender, submission is the sweet aroma that's in Christ. The sweet aroma of fellowship within the church and the sweet aroma of evangelism when you're out reaching people. That's why we've started all what they call compassion ministries here with Karis House and MVO and with the clinic out here when people come in and, and, and we have the place to give groceries and try to help people. You just don't give anything or everything, but you, you reach out in compassion. It's a sweet aroma. You ever been in a church that stinks? I, I don't mean the physical smell. I'm talking about the spiritual aroma. Death. Stay away from me. I had a man the other day told me, he said, Pastor, I brought somebody to Olive the other day, and we sat down. Somebody came and said, would you please move? You are in my seat. That stinks. Let me just remind you of something. Look her on the side of that bench, Wayne. Is your name on that anywhere? <laughs> no. Wayne is yours on there. JT. Okay. You don't own a seat. There used to be churches where you own seats. Back in the day. You paid and you got to sit in a certain place. We do not do that at Olive. That's not the aroma you want in the fellowship. The, the aroma you want, would you like to have my seat? Would you like to sit here? I'll go sit somewhere else. It all starts with surrender, submission. Chained to the chariot and the authority of God begins to cascade through your life. I'm learning. I really am. I'm learning. Take me all these years. I'm learning. I'm better than I've ever been. Not as good as I'm going to be, but I'm better than I've ever been. God's helping me. I'm learning to die to myself. I'm, I've been a great Houdini Christian. I can get out of those chains. Well, I have to come back. And just, I couldn't sleep this morning. I don't know why. It's just nuts. I've slept great this week. I was up 3.30 this morning, and that's the fast time. So I got up and had my quiet time, and I just, it was, you know, nobody around. I just went out and got on my little altar, and I, I prayed for us this day and just prayed for God to do a work here. I said, Lord, I, if there's something in me, just get that out of me. Lord, I want to be in submission to you. And, and I just started, I sit up here every Sunday. Some of you will see me do it every now and then, but I, while they're getting the last song ready, I'm always, I'm saying, I've learned it from just reading Spurgeon's biography that right before he had walked to the pulpit, he had whispered this under his breath, I believe in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I believe in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I believe in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I believe in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And he's just saying, God, I can't do this, but you can. God, what we need here today is not more me. We need more of you. <laughs> Lord, if we ever get in submission, submission, it, it, it calls for surrender and submission, and when that happens, there comes a sweet aroma.
That doesn't mean you agree with everything. No, no, no. But when you confront, you do it in a kind manner. I surrender all. Copies of today's service are available in audio and video formats. Call us toll-free at 1-877-OLIVE-BC to place your order. Dr. Trailer's sermons, along with information about Olive, are also available on the Internet by visiting olivebaptist.org.